obviously you don't want to get anything wrong while making your film or in production on whatever project you're working on. It would suck to screw up the audio on a great line, but in post you do have the option for ADR. If your framing isn't perfect or maybe too shaky or not shaky enough like it was for me during Ballistic, you can adjust that as well. There were a lot of shots that Lucas Harger and I added some post camera shake to. And that's the beauty of those mistakes. You have some room to adjust in post. It's not ideal. I always want to get everything in camera if I can, but you still have a bit of a safety net. But there's one thing you absolutely cannot get wrong, and that is the focus. More often than not, an out of focus shot is going to be a ruined one. I have at times used slightly soft shots since the performance was what I wanted, but that is still sacrificing something. There's a bit of confidence lost when you have things like that, especially if you have focus that is searching and not confident. And this goes for work outside of film as well. Imagine the cutting of the cake at a wedding all blurry. The client's product, anything but tack sharp. But your focus is also a creative choice. Where you put it, how shallow the depth of field is, it's a great tool in telling your story as well. So today we're looking at depth of field and pulling focus, specifically as a one person band, not with an AC, but instead when you have to do it yourself. And right up front, let's take a look at the tool that we are using. You can of course pull right off the barrel of the lens. I do that often and it works just fine. But if you want more precision and you wanna get your hands away from the lens to reduce any unwanted movement, a small follow focus like the Small Rig Mini Follow Focus 3010 is a perfect option. We partnered with Small Rig on this episode and they sent this our way and I'm really digging it. It's got a great size, it's well built, and I like that I can put it anywhere, but we'll get to that. I'm using this on my Pocket 6K Pro and I have this Small Rig cage on here now, which has all these mounting points so I can mount things like a monitor, these handles, and of course the follow focus, which side note, I love having a top handle. It is insanely useful useful. So with this follow focus unit, you get the rod clamp and rod. So you don't need a rail system for this. If you have a cage like this, it'll mount right to that to stay compact. Then you have the snap on gear ring. Great part about that is that it wraps around the lens, then snaps together like this so that it's pretty universal to fit any lens. And then of course, the mini follow focus unit itself. To attach it, first we're going to take the gear ring and snap that onto our lens if we need it. If we're using a DSLR lens like our 24 through 105, here, we would need to snap that on, but we're gonna go with one of our Rokinons, which already have the teeth here, so no need for the ring in this case. And as you can see here, we have a lot of flex in its position, so a lot of options for where and how we mount it. But once you have it on, we'll connect the teeth of our system to the gear ring, and there you go. And again, with the cage like this, we can put the system anywhere. I had it mounted underneath at one point so I could stabilize the camera while pulling focus away from the barrel, sort of a best of both worlds. It's Sounds weird, but I actually liked pulling this way. I, mean, I like, Josh hated it. It was weird. But I, I liked it. It was weird. But we're gonna put the follow focus back on the side here. And another great advantage to using this is the AB stop. So if I have two specific points I need to nail, especially if I'm trying to do the move fast, I can set my two points with these knobs here, then I can hit those marks perfectly every time, which again is massively helpful if you are trying to do a very fast focus move. And even more so if it's very shallow depth of field that you are working with. For things that don't come in the box, you can also get these interchangeable gears, larger or smaller to give you finer control over your moves. We have a mid ground situation that comes with it, which I'm happy with. And of course, if you do have someone pulling focus for you, you have your ring here for placing your marks to hit that focus point every single time. Of course, everything that we are showing here is just for pulling focus with this system. But the great thing about a unit like this is that you can also use it on your iris or zoom ring as well. So if you need to do an iris pull mid shot like we did here going from exterior to interior in ghost house, or if you want a much more smooth zoom, you need to get your hands off the lens and onto something like this. But just removing your hands from the barrel and using a system like this will make a massive difference in performing a manual zoom. If you wanna know more about the small rig follow focus, check out the link in the notes below. And using something like this effectively does come with practice. I mean, even pulling right off the lens does. Getting a feel for your lens, how far the throw is, how sensitive the ring, it all comes to just working with it. You really wanna use it consistently until it's just second nature 
nature. You perform it without even thinking about it. Especially since the more shallow your depth of field, the more difficult it all gets, which may prompt you to consider closing that aperture down to make it easier, which may be what you want, but more often than not, I prefer a more shallow depth of field. It's all taste and subjective, but for me, like a more wide aspect ratio, like two, three, five to one, shallow depth of field feels more cinematic. But then on a less subjective point, your depth of field is a great tool to focus your audience as well. No, no, Ryan. You gotta pull their Stop. focus in. Stop. It's not funny? No. Oh. God. Sorry, I'll try to focus Stop, more on the Ryan. next joke. Where you put your focus instructs the viewer on what is important. For instance, more often than not, the character talking would be the one in focus. But if we throw them out of focus and instead have it on the one listening, we're telling the audience that the reaction is more important than what's being said. It can also be used as a reveal for a prop or maybe a character. And again, the depth of field you choose does affect the style of the shot in question. With, of course, the main way you adjust your depth of field being your aperture. But let's step back. When you focus focus on a specific point, you are measuring the distance from the point that you want in focus to your sensor, which will be indicated by the focus plane mark on the side of your camera like this one here. So we get that measurement to our subject, then we set our focus ring to that number and we have the point in front of our lens that is in perfect focus. Now, if we look on the side of that subject that we pulled our focus to, we see a flat plane here that will be in perfect focus. It's not the only thing that will be in focus, but it is the plane in front of the lens that's in perfect focus, but we'll extend out from here, front and behind to the areas that will be in focus based on our focal length, our distance from the subject, and of course our aperture size, and this space makes up our depth of field. If we were to stop down our lens or increase the f-stop number, our aperture opening will shrink, which reduces the amount of light that can pass through the lens and increases our depth of field. If we go in the opposite direction and move toward a lower f-stop or t-stop number, our aperture opening will increase in size, letting light flood in and will reduce our depth of field. And like I said, you have those three factors that affect your depth of field, the aperture, the distance from your subject, and your focal length. Why that's the case is really interesting and something that we will get into in an episode of its own, but for now, let's leave the science there. But something that I think is worth looking at is how a shot can feel different depending on the f-stop you choose to shoot at. So let's take a look at that right now. Now to have the option of what f-stop you shoot at, you'll need an extra tool, specifically when shooting outside in the sun. When we open wide here, we need to boost our shutter a bit to not overexpose so badly like this, which is not what we want. And that's where this little guy comes in. This beautiful little baby is the Small Rig Mini Matte Box 3196. And right away, you can see the best part about this thing is it's tiny, which for a camera like our Pocket 6K Pro, this is so much better. The larger matte boxes just feel like overkill and get in the way of staying really compact with a camera like this. It also comes with these different adapter rings for different size lenses. And after you slip the matte box on, the major plus with that is you can still use threaded filters with this system, not just tray mounted ones. But of course, the best part of a matte box like this is the tray mounted filters. This tray is great too, just slips right off. You toss your filter on and slips right back on, which this can be stackable too. Of course, you have the barn door here to help block any light leaks you don't want, like we showed in our other matte box episode. But again, the best part are the filters. There's so much that you can do right in camera with all kinds of great filters to really dial in your image in a way that can be tough in post-production. But going back to why I started this, NDs. For shooting outside and wanting to maintain a shallower depth of field, NDs are an absolute must. So I can slip mine on here and bring down my values so I can open up my iris. Like the fall of focus, you can find out more about this matte box in the notes below. It's really well built. And again, I love how small this is, mounts right to your lens and stays out of your way. Regardless of where you land taste wise, you will have to pull focus. You could of course go autofocus, but personally, unless it's a vlog style, 
style situation or photography, autofocus isn't for me. So that means getting used to pulling it manually. I said it on an episode before, but one of the best ways to practice for me is to film younger people. When I was younger, I would film my younger brothers and sisters or nieces and nephews, just kids are nuts. Home video type stuff where they're doing their thing because kids never sit still and they're completely unpredictable. So it's great practice. It's also great to work on recognizing distances quickly. I used to stand at a random distance from an object and I would guess what that distance was, then check my answer with a tape measurer. And it wasn't long until I was nailing it within a few inches. And again, it's a big advantage to get your hands off of the lens and onto a follow focus wheel like this one, both for pulling your own focus, which gives you more smooth and precise shifts, and so that you can have the ability to have a focus puller if it's called for. Again, you can find out more about this small rig follow focus in the notes below. You can also find info for our summer sale. Everything on our store is 30% off right now. So if you wanna grab any of our VFX assets, LUTs, music, or sound effects, jump over and get that now. The sale ends at the end of July. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.